Hi, I'm Daniel Boya, and I'll be presenting TIDE, our toolkit for identifying errors in object detection and instance segmentation. These fields have made rapid progress in the past several years, thanks in part to competition on challenging detection and segmentation benchmarks. Typically, performance on these benchmarks is summarized by one number, mean average precision, which is a complicated term that involves integrating over a precision recall curve and averaging over several criteria. While MAP is good for determining the best model in a competition, it's a very complicated and high-level summary of a model's performance. In most practical applications, we need more granular information about the model's strengths and weaknesses. For instance, for self-driving cars, we really care mostly about the existence of a pedestrian on the road, and a course localization is acceptable. What we don't want to happen is that a pedestrian gets missed by the detector or classified as the road. So in this situation, we care more about the recall and correct classification than we do about precise localization. Other applications have a different set of concerns, and just by looking at MAP, there's no way to assess how a model performs over these aspects. What we want is a compact summary of the errors in our model in order to determine its strengths and weaknesses. There's a reason our model didn't get 100% MAP, and there are several types of error that account for that gap. With TIDE, our general toolkit for identifying detection and segmentation errors, we break down the missing MAP into six error types that fully explain where the model is losing performance. We take careful consideration to make sure that each error type's contribution to the missing MAP is accurately represented, which is necessary to draw meaningful conclusions. Furthermore, our approach is dataset agnostic, making cross-dataset comparison possible, and our method uses all detections produced by the model, making this a holistic summary. Finally, our toolkit is easy to augment and allows for deeper analysis when necessary. There are only a few other works in the space that attempt to provide a useful summary of all the errors in a detection model such as Derek Holm et al.'s seminal work on diagnosing errors in object detectors, and the analysis mode built into the COCO Evaluation Toolkit. However, both have issues, such as being dataset-specific or being difficult to interpret. So it's clear that we want to extract the contribution of each error in our models, but what's not clear is how we should weigh these contributions. Holm et al.'s work and the COCO Eval Toolkit both weigh errors differently, and both approaches have weaknesses. Holm et al. weights errors by their prevalence in the top end scoring erroneous detections. While this method is very intuitive, it doesn't describe an error type's contribution to overall MAP, it ignores lower scoring detections, and it only works for false positives. The COCO Evaluation Toolkit, on the other hand, attempts to update Holm et al.'s work by representing errors in terms of their effect on the precision recall curve. However, the plots they produce are difficult to interpret, and more importantly, turn out to be drastically misrepresenting the importance of certain error types. Using the COCO eval method, this black curve represents the unchanged model, then this blue curve represents the new precision recall curve after ignoring classification errors. This next yellow curve represents ignoring both classification and localization errors, and so on for the rest of the curves. The importance of each error in the COCO toolkit is given by the shaded region between curves. Looking at this plot, the background error in the purple is clearly the most important. However, because of how precision recall curves work, if we simply compute these errors in a different order, something surprising happens. Here, we compute background errors first, swapping the background and classification errors. And just by changing the order of computation, background error is suddenly not a concern, and classification error now has a huge weight on it. Intrinsically, computing errors in this way overemphasizes the effect of errors computed last, and thus this method isn't viable for analysis. When designing TIDE's approach, we carefully considered these issues. To compute our error summary, we first define a set of errors such that fixing all of them would result in 100 MAP. These errors are classification error for when a box fits the ground truth well, but is the wrong class, localization error for when a box is the correct class, but doesn't fit the ground truth well, both for when the box is both misclassified and mislocalized, duplicate for when two boxes match the same ground truth, background, for when a box doesn't overlap with any ground truth, and finally, missed, for ground truth the detector completely missed. Then we measure each error's contribution to the missing MAP by taking the difference between the MAP with that error fixed and the original MAP of the model. Since we compute these errors individually, this method doesn't have the same issues with reordering like the COCO eval toolkit does. Finally, TIDE summarizes its results in a card like this. The pie chart shows the relative importance of each error, while the bar plots show the absolute effect on MAP. Then, these six error types account for all errors in the model, but there's other potential splits that would make sense. 
With this toolkit, we can define custom air types to demonstrate this ability, and because it's generally useful in analysis, we define another split here between false positive errors and false negative errors. With this in mind, let's take a look at how Tide can be used for analysis in several different contexts. First, we can directly compare the summaries of two or more models. This can assist in choosing the best model for a given task, but it also allows us to more clearly understand how the design choices made by the authors affect their models. For instance, Yolak++ is a real-time instance segmenter that builds off of a cut-down version of Redinet. If we compare the object detection branch of Yolak++ to that of Redinet, we can get an idea of how the author's changes affected the model. And we can immediately see from this comparison that the changes Yolak made to speed up the model mostly hurts their localization and misdetection performance, and also significantly changes the balance of false positives and false negatives. Using the information drawn from these comparisons, as model designers, we can get an idea of what components of our methods we should be focusing on to improve performance. Moreover, we can use these quantitative metrics to back up our intuitions when explaining design choices and when backing up conclusions drawn from qualitative observation. However, there are cases where the summary cards wouldn't be enough. Let's consider a comparison between HCC and TridentNet. Both models have remarkably similar error profiles, so to understand the difference between the two, we'll need to delve deeper. To do this, we'll take a look at performance across different scales, since TridentNet focuses specifically on scale invariance. With Tide, we can compute our errors across different object attributes by simply limiting the errors we fix to those with the specified attribute. Here's the localization error of HCC and TridentNet across different scales of boxes, with Mascar CNN for reference. We can see from this finer analysis that while HCC and TridentNet have the same localization error overall, it's really that TridentNet has less error on medium objects and HCC has less error on large objects. These two differences end up canceling out, but if you're someone looking to detect medium objects, you would use this information to choose Tridentnet over HCC. Tide supports any user-defined attribute for this kind of analysis. Then, since Tide is dataset agnostic, we can use it to discover properties of datasets themselves. To do this, we can fix an architecture and then compare that architecture's performance across different datasets. For instance, let's compare Mascara CNN's performance on Coco versus Elvis which is a version of Coco that attempts to annotate every class of object. Intuitive reasoning would suggest that Elvis would induce a lot of classification errors, since it has over a thousand classes compared to Coco's 80. However, we can see that this really isn't the case in practice. In fact, most of the missing performance on Elvis, when compared to Coco, is due to the detector leaving out objects completely. If you want to tackle Elvis, you need to keep in mind that detecting objects at all is half the battle. And this type of analysis is useful for people looking to design a new dataset with a particular challenge, or those looking to tackle new datasets as well. Finally, the tide metrics can be used to explain MAP changes in ablation studies. Let's say we found that our model's confidence wasn't calibrated well with the quality of its localizations, so we wanted to add a branch that rescores the localizations based on quality. We've implemented the module, but our MAP only increases from 58.1 to 58.3. Did our module do anything significant? If we take a look at the tide error distribution before and after the model instead of just the MAP, we can see that the localization error went down significantly as we had hoped. But all these other error types went up, which balanced out the MAP in the end. Without this extra justification from tide, we wouldn't have known that our method actually worked. And since tide can be compactly represented as just a bunch of numbers, this kind of analysis fits neatly into ablation tables. We hope to see tide being used for all of these modes of analysis and more. To that effect, we've tried making Tide as simple to use as possible. In fact, Tide is a drop-in replacement for standard MAP calculations. All you need to do, if you've been using Coco eval, for example, is swap your Coco eval code for these few lines of Tide code, and you get all this extra information about your model. And since it's been a problem for previous toolkits, we've also tried to make the code as clear as possible. Moreover, our toolbox is extensible. You can define your own errors, your own datasets, and your own custom modes of analysis. Tide is available here, and we've opened up to the community for future development. We hope Tide can become the basis for future analysis in object detection and instance segmentation. Thank you for listening to my talk.